We're very privileged to have Terry York speak to us at this hour. I've known Terry for seven years. When the Northside Church of Christ in Calhoun, Georgia formed, Terry was preaching for an area congregation. And I met him upon their organization. They're coming together to work together as a collective functioning unit in uh, Calhoun. And later, following their establishment as a local congregation, Terry moved there and became the associate preacher and also serves as one of the elders of the Northside Church of Christ. For those of us who've known about the present controversy in which we've been engaged for almost two years, for those of us who know about that controversy have a deep love and appreciation for the church at Northside in Calhoun. We have a deep love for the elders. Brother Ron Hall and Terry York are the elders of that congregation. They've stood unflinchingly and unwaveringly for God's truth. And I deeply love those men. I consider them two of the very fine friends I have in this life. Terry's a graduate of Memphis School of Preaching, I believe in 1989. He's been preaching since then. And primarily he's done all of his work in North Georgia where he's a native. And Terry's a fine man. He's a good preacher. And we appreciate him so much, and we're very thankful that he's here to speak to us at this hour. Terry. And any time I'm out of North Georgia, I'm uneasy. <laughs> I feel a little bit better, though, because when I was thinking about coming down my first flight ever on a jet plane, I wrote David Brown, and I told him I was a little bit uneasy about this, about crashing. He said, you don't have to worry about crashing. You're coming in one of the fourth largest metropolitan cities in the good old USA, and if you make it without getting shot or somebody running over you <laughs> to the building, then you'll be fine, or you can be thankful. So I feel a lot better about that. And I'm also uh, uneasy about traveling without the family. They were not able to come, but who knows, in the future, maybe I'll be able to bring them and meet you too. I thank all of you for what you've done and the accommodations of getting us here and for Brother Cohen, or Cone and Sister Cone for keeping me. And speaking about uneasy, when I got here last night, I said, and just to think, these men may introduce me. And not only that, I'm going to go home with him and stay. <laughs> so from the things that he said about Brother McClish and Brother Parker, I didn't tell a whole lot more uneasy about that. But nonetheless, here in David Brown, I, I want to thank you for letting me try to select something I think that I could speak on today in relationship to fellowship. And of course, that has to do with Deuteronomy chapter 7. And the title of my lesson is, in the light of Romans chapter 15, 4, what lessons on Christian fellowship may be learned from Deuteronomy chapter 7? Last night, as we met together in David Brown's house, we began to talk about illustrations that cannot be used across the waters overseas that are used here. We talked about illustrations just last Wednesday night for Devo at Northside. I taught a little lesson on the boll weevil. Now, the little boll weevil entered into your state about 1890, and I made some comparisons how the boll weevil and sin have a lot in common the way they work. But now you go to the Bible and you read the Old and New Testament, you're going to see a lot of uh, beautiful spiritual lessons that are taught by the use of animate and inanimate objects. And uh, very, very effective. Jesus used them in his teaching in the New Testament, often incorporated those into his parables and his teaching. Well, that's a good way to instill a biblical, spiritual principle or truth. When you think about that, I think about Paul's writings. And a lot of the times in his writings, he would use an Old Testament example or illustration to enforce a New Testament truth, something that he was teaching. We find that in Romans 15:4, where there he has uh, previously quoted from Psalm 69, verse 9. And he said, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures may have hope. And I think of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. There are at least six illustrations there, as he writes, of Old Testament events. And he writes to the church there at Corinth, and he uses those to warn them that it is possible for one to fall from grace. 
And he'll even say in verses 6 and verse 11 that those things are given to us for examples that we may not do the things that they did. But now when you think about such passages in Deuteronomy chapter 7, and we look at those things, are there really any lessons or anything that we can learn from that in connection with fellowship? Can we do that without stretching a truth or implying something that really doesn't exist? That is possible. Well, I think we can. And I like what uh, old uh, brother, or not brother Henry, Matthew Henry said about such. He says, what happened to the Old Testament saints happened to them for in sample. And the scriptures of the Old Testament are left for a standing rule to us. They are written that they might remain for our use and benefit. So in this, what he is saying, very true, not only are the examples, there are some principles that are laid down in the Old Testament that are everlasting. Now those things are, in a sense, when you talk about those principles, they're, they're unchanging. And I believe what's said in Deuteronomy chapter 7, there are some things there that we can benefit and learn in relationship to fellowship. First of all, I think there are some implications there that there are restrictions even today as there was in, in that time. Look at a little background. Deuteronomy chapter 1, you're going to find about verse 3. When you compare that with Joshua chapter 4 and verse 19, there is about 70 days from the time that he begins to speak these words there until the children of Israel will cross the Jordan River into the land of Canaan. Now, it had been 40 years since they had left the land of Egypt headed for that particular place, the land of Canaan. And we find, as Moses tells them in chapter 1, verses 19 through 39, why that is true. It's because of unbelief. But now, now that they're going to be going into that land, and they're going to possess the land, and they're going to settle in the land, one of the great dangers that they're going to face in that land is idolatry. Well, what do you do about such a peril as that? He's already warned them in chapter 4, this is going to be a problem. And as you read throughout the book of Deuteronomy, you're going to see that one of the problems that they're going to face is going to be idolatry. But there's a way to avoid falling into the perils of idolatry. And the solution is given, Deuteronomy chapter 7, and this is not just a good suggestion, this is a command. Deuteronomy chapter 7, beginning verse 1, he says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whether thou goest to possess it, and it's cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Gergesites, the Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou give unto thy son. And when we read that, we ask the question, is there any connection between maybe the word covenant in here and the word fellowship in the New Testament? Well, if you look up the definition of both those words in those places, you'll see that there are similarities. And he says, if you're going to avoid idolatry in the land of promise, you need to avoid any practice or anything in the most remote related to that. Notice again what Matthew Henry said in relationship to this. He said, here we have a very strict caution against all friendship and fellowship with idols and idolaters. Those that are taken into communion with, Christ, with God must have no communion with the unfruitful works of darkness these things they are asked about for the preventing of this snare now before them. Now we could read a lot of warnings that are very similar to this. You can read in Deuteronomy chapter 13 verses 6 through 11 and he mentions there don't even speak about it. Don't even think about it. 
And he said, if some of your brethren do mention that and try to entice you to let's go and let's go after these idols, that person is to be put to death. God meant for his people to have no relationship with those heathen about them. And you can go back and look at Exodus chapter 34, verse 10 to 17, and you can see almost the very same word there that's used in Deuteronomy chapter 7 to idols and idolatry. And there in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 13, he says, Make no mentions of other gods, neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. One more thing let's notice about them before we uh, get a little further and, and make the application. If you go from Deuteronomy where we are now and just look backward and just begin to think of all the times regardless of the warnings they had, they still fell into idolatry. Well, you can go back to Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 through 3 in there. You can see what happened at Baal Peor how about 24,000 fell because of idolatry. And you continue to go back in the Bible, say, Exodus chapter 32. And you see, no sooner had they gotten out of Egypt, come to Sinai, and they're engaged in idolatry. Well, you can go further than that. Go back to Genesis chapter 11. You go back to Genesis chapter 11, you begin to read about Abraham's ancestry, then compare that with what Joshua said in Joshua chapter 24. A problem with idolatry. All up to this time. And that's going to be the thing that faces them in the new land, the greatest peril. You want to avoid the snare? Stay away from them. Have no communion. Have nothing to do with them whatsoever. The same is true if we look forward in the Bible. We can go to the Bible look forward to such places. as the, We'll just look at the book of Judges. Look at the prophets of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and look how deeply those people could plunge into idolatry. Now what would have what would have prevented that if they had never even entertained a thought of such? If they had never, once they did entertain the thought, began to look in that direction and then gradually come to the point that they found themselves where in the book of Judges you'll find seven major oppressions there of those people falling and God would punish them and they would return. Finally, in the book of, uh, as you read also this history, in the book of Second Kings and the Chronicles, how that because of idolatry and how they plunged to those depths, there were three captivities in the north, three in the south, and that pretty well cured their quench for idolatry. But now, I think, too, a lot of times I don't know why things happen as far as why people fall away, why people begin to uh, fellowship where they're not supposed to be and have no business and why they're taken off into some uh, error or something. But I do know it. And I think I do know how to avoid it. And I think that we apply those principles that we find in Deuteronomy chapter 7, and we can avoid a lot of downfall, especially when it comes to the idea of fellowship. And something else that we find that's true in the New Testament as the warning is given in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, where he says, evil conditions will corrupt good manners or good morals. So the best thing to do if we're going to stay pure and remain faithful to truth, it's just don't associate with those who do not love the truth and those who do depart, depart from the truth. And another thing that we see in both Old Testament and New Testament, fellowship is based on a submitting and remaining in God's covenant, whether it be the Old Testament or the New Testament. There is the way to remain in fellowship with God and fellowship with other. You will see that repeatedly through the book of Deuteronomy. You continue in my statutes, in my covenant, my ordinances, and then I will be with you and you will receive the favors from that. But if not, then I will disown you. 
One of the things that's said about Abraham in James chapter 2, verse 23, Abraham was a friend of God. Abraham was a friend of God because we can go back as far as Genesis chapter 18 and verse 19, 18 and 19 really, and we see that Abraham was faithful. He was teaching his children after him to be faithful, and he was continuing in God's covenant that he made with him. A lot of times other men can express things so much better than I can. And when it comes to the New Testament fellowship, of course, think of when that fellowship with God and man begins. We can go back to Acts chapter 2 and we can read that. Those that gladly received the teaching on the day of Pentecost, those that gladly received the teaching there were baptized and there were added to them about a thousand souls. They contended steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. That's where that fellowship begins. Or as John would say in 1 John chapter 1, beginning about verse 3, he says, This teaching, these things I declare unto you, that you all may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Jesus Christ. He said, These things I write unto you, that your joy may be full, and he said, This then is the message which I declare to you, that God's light in him is no darkness. And then he said, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So our fellowship beginning with him, God, we have to submit to his covenant, be a New Testament Christian, obey that gospel, and then we have to continue to walk in that light. And if we do, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ will continually cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And there is. And as one writer said, I'll just read this. He says, The phrase Christian fellowship brings to mind the sweet spirit of love that is to exist among brethren, those of like precious faith. It is the most precious gifts that God allows us to enjoy while here on earth. This fellowship, however, is limited to those who have obeyed the gospel of Christ and are living in continued faithfulness to God. God's word is the standard and measure of Christian fellowship or fellowship among our Christians. The word of God must not only be our guide in determining boundaries and limitations of fellowship within the brotherhood of the Christians, but also with those who were once faithful and are now unfaithful to the Word of God. Well, I'll just read all of this. It's good. We that are called into the fellowship of God's dear Son when we obey the gospel, we have no right to extend that fellowship to those who have not complied the God-given conditions of entering into that realm of fellowship. Christian fellowship is based solely on our... is based solely on... Uh, is not based solely on our judgment. It is based on truth, God's Word. I think that's a good statement. He just concised what I've said up to this point, and I think said that very well. But as sweet as fellowship is, and as much as we all desire it, it does have limitations. And we are expected to uh, remain in those boundaries and those limitations. How good and how good it is for brethren to dwell in unity, Psalm 133 and verse 1. And it is not true, not true, the reason that we refuse to go where some people go is because we're mean and because we want a name of being sound and a big name. Not true. The truth is that we just cannot go where they go and we cannot go to the extent that some other brethren do. Let's look at a few scriptures. Let's... Let's think about it. Even uh, just to summarize what the Lord said there in Matthew chapter 18, 15 through 18, he says, you know, if a brother sins, if he transgresses against you, you go to him and you tell him his fault. And if he will repent, then it's over. The matter is settled. But what if he doesn't? Well, if he doesn't, you know, he's been pretty good in the past. He's done a lot of good good thing, so let's overlook it. No, he says do this. He says, I, you take two or more, or one or more witness with you, and then you go with him where in the mouth of uh, witnesses every word may be established. But he may not hear that. Well, if he doesn't, you tell it to the church. 
And then if he fails to hear the church, you let that man be as a heathen and as a publican. Well, how many sins will he have to commit before you do that? One? Well, say it is one. Say it is a transgression, but say, well, with everything he has done in the past, we're just not going to make an issue over that because it's really not that big a thing, and I don't think it is a right to divide over one sin, maybe. But think about it. If you have a man, have you, and you have dealt with people, most of you have, if you have a man that will not repent of one and he is so dead set, it's not going to, sin has to go in the fire. And that's what's going to happen is Barney fires, nip it in the bud. There's a Bible principle there. Sin is supposed to be dealt with or is to be dealt with the way that the Bible wants to do so. And I want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Here's another instance. Here's a way to uh, deal with sin, the very plain in that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You know that this is talking about the incestuous fornicator. And Paul writes concerning this, he said in verse 1, It is commonly reported that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife, and ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned, that he, that he that had done this deed might be taken away from you. Now I want to drop down. And uh, verse 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of judgment. All right, he's given instruction what to do with this man. This man is a fornicator, and Paul said, I've, I've heard this about him. You withdraw fellowship with him because if you do this, this man... This is done with the intent that the man will be saved, that he will repent of that sin. I want you to look at something else now. You know that verse that I skipped. In verse 3, he says, For I verily as absolute, but present in the Spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed. Paul, have you gone and talked to him personally, this fornicator? Well, no, I hadn't. Well, don't you think you should do that? Because after all, look in the next chapter at the kind of people that are in the church at Corinth. Can you believe them? So how can you really know, and where are you? And this is just hearsay. Can you withdraw on hearsay? Can you practice and enforce God's boundaries on fellowship without talking to him? He says, even though I'm not here, if I have sufficient evidence and what you're saying is true and that's consistent, I can make that judgment without being there. I believe that was, that's what he's telling them. I believe that point there. Now, what about other such passages? What about other such patients? Now, go to the book of Revelation, read chapters 2 and 3, look at those churches, and just for example, look at Ephesus first. Does not the Lord commend the church at Ephesus for their good works? Yes. Are they sound in doctrine? Well, they are. But he says, but still, I have somewhat against because you've left your first love. And even though you may be faithful in this area, you need to be faithful in all things. And he says also, even though you're sound in the faith, because you have left that love, he says, there's repentance due there. And if not, I'll come and remove the candlestick. Fellowship will be broken. When a person persists in sin and refuses to repent of that sin. And I think those lessons are, are very obvious. There's no problem with the instruction that is given in the Old and New Testament, both concernship and relationships, and how people be, can become ensnared and entangled and fall away and re, even lose sight of the purpose of the Lord's church over this little thing, I say not a little thing, but this thing, fellowship. But then we look at, yes, there are restrictions, and we have looked at the reason in that, but there are reasons that God gave that uh, injunction. I go back to Deuteronomy chapter 7 again. Why? 
why do we not want to intermingle with these uh, heathen? He says, verse 4, heathen, for they will turn away the Son from following me, that they may serve God. God's. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled again and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars, break down their images, cut down their groves, burn their graven images with fire. And for thou art holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath not chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. Uh, he hath chosen thee above people that on the face of the earth. He, he didn't do this because you were many. Verse 7, the Lord did not set his love upon you or choose you because you were more in number than other people. But, uh, verse 8, he did this because he, he loved you. So that's why really, he did this, that I won't fall. He did this because I'm a special people, and he did this because he loved us. That's why he gives that instruction. And the most, as was last night, very, very true love for God and true love for the brethren are those who actually practice this. It's not mean that you know yourself that you will bear more reproach and mental anguish for doing this probably more than anything else you can do in upholding in the truth, and that is refusing to cross the line when it comes to fellowship. And it's very hard in physical families to do this, Sometimes people do not want to do this in their family. They don't want to lose those relationships with those that are closest to them. But you can gain that relationship if you'll practice what God says in his word. That's, that's the best hope that we have. And that is doing what he says when it comes to restoring those that have fallen away. And it's not because we don't think the best of someone else. And I say that we're not naive. And we can be optimistic for things to be better, but we can not let our optimism and uh, not let that be to the extent that we ignore a problem that is there. And people will say things to you that don't understand, well, you kicked them out of the church. And that's, that's about all fellowship means to a lot of people. But when God says, and this is the way you do this in Deuteronomy chapter 7 to those people that are going to be entering into the new land. They practice those same principles in the New Testament. This, when God says something, it's good for both parties involved. It's good for the faithful and it's good for the unfaithful. It's good for the faithful because if I sever myself, as God says to do, when everything has been done to restore fellowship, then I'm not going to be pulled all the time. I can put that behind me, and then I can go on and doing the work that God tells me to do. And on the other hand, if I do that, what he says for the party law, then there's a hope that they'll be restored. So it's good for all. We obey his law and his will on fellowship. That's the only hope for those being saved. Let's look at some uh, reasons I gave in the book a couple of examples at least, Balaam. And I think of Balaam there in Numbers chapter 22 through 24 where we read of him. I don't know a lot about him. Uh, I've read, tried to, where did he, you know, where was he doing his work? But I do know this. I knew, I do know that he was sent for to call to curse God's people from Balak. And uh, he knew better. Apparently from the text he knew better than what he was doing, and he, no, I won't do that. Let me ask God and see what he has to say about this. No, you're not going to curse those people. You're not going to go with those messengers of, of Balak. Well, I won't go beyond the word of the Lord. He said, I cannot go beyond that to do, do anything. But watch him. What he does is he really, from what it appears in the text, he wants to. And he continues through those up 22, 23, and chapter 24. So finally, we have the break between chapter 24 of Numbers into chapter 25. Those first three verses, there we have them uh, involved in idolatry and eating those sacrifices offered to idols. And then I can read uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, 
I think it's verse 15, and then Jude, verse 11, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14, and I can get an insight to what he did. I can get the whole story by reading the, all the account about him and what took place. He really wanted all the time those rewards of divination. He wanted that, and finally, even though he could not curse God's people, he knew that God's people were weak when it came to whoredom, idolatry, and eating those sacrifices. So he just made it possible for them to intermingle with the heathen and look at what happened. As we mentioned earlier, 24,000 of them fell because of that little event. And you go back and read uh, Numbers chapter 31, and you know where Midian is destroyed, and old Balaam, he fell with them for what he did also. But there, how much different maybe would that have read if Balaam had really st stood and says, I will not go with you, I won't even entertain the thought again, that you can just forget that altogether. Now, I need to make an application a little bit, as much as I can. Uh, someone mentioned to me last night they're going to speak somewhere, and uh, I'm not going to say it like that, but a lot of times I'll read something, and I'll see people going to places that I really think shouldn't go, and they shouldn't be there. And they say, I'll go and preach the truth anywhere. Balaam would have said that too. And I think they may go and preach the truth anywhere. But there's a lot of things that ring in my mind that, that really stuck with me that I've heard men say. And I think it's true. Keith Moser told, me, told us in class one time, and I'll never forget this. He said, and he was quoting some other preacher, remember that. But he says, boys, you can preach the truth all your life and still go to hell. Now, you can go and preach the truth places and not preach what they need to hear or address certain things. You'll accomplish nothing. Because if you do, uh, it won't be long. You won't have to mark them. You will become very popular where you're going, and they will draw the line for you. But as a rule... Now, something I read recently, and Ron and I have talked about at Northside, you really don't ever see liberals drawing a line of fellowship. They're always moving it, moving it, moving it, moving it, and you just make a few observations. That seems to be the way it happens. You talked about somebody, now Solomon. Solomon was probably outside our Lord, the wisest man to ever live. And if that that man could be entangled, and I believe it started. Of course, he violated a lot of principles laid down in Deuteronomy, multiplied them, silver, gold, horses, wives, made an affinity, Pharaoh, to the king of Pharaoh's daughter in 1 Kings chapter 4. And then you find that Pharaoh, uh, Solomon also begins to take, take unto him other wives of the heathen and uh, Let's read. This is wrong in my manuscript. I, I caught it. It's supposed to be 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, and I put Deuteronomy chapter 11, so you may want to correct that. But in 1 Kings 11, verse 1 and 2, notice this about Solomon. Solomon loved many strange women together, had daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonian, Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither ye they can to you, for surely they will turn away your heart, or their heart after God. Solomon claimed to these in love. And you know what the result of that was, those of you that are familiar with that history. Uh, uh, Solomon instigated something there that would not leave Israel, the United Kingdom. They would divide, and then they would continue in that. That would apply until the time that they were going to be carried away into captivity. Now, if Solomon can't handle a bad relationship, what is, what's going to happen to me if I engage in something like that? See, these things, for examples, I'm not above what God says, and I'm, it can happen to me just as well as it happened to him. But not only that, not only that they might not be carried away, but they're God people are a holy people. And um, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and, you know, Peter quotes Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44, 
here in 1 Peter 2 and, 2 and 9 where he says, he says, But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And I want to call to mind another verse. Look at the, look at the different words that are used in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, 15, warning God's people, don't, don't have any association with the heathen. He, spe he says, be not unequally one together with unbelievers. For what? Number two, fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness. What? Number three, communion hath light with darkness. Well, none. What? Concord hath Christ with Belial. What? Part hath he that believeth with the agreement have the temple of God with idols. Six times in those verses, he's saying, and those are all different words used to describe. He says, stay from, from this type of activity. Don't do this. And why would he give warning? That people may not fall. Why would he do that? He does that because he, he loves people. There's no question of that. God has demonstrated that over and over again. And finally, what if I do what he says? What are the rewards of obedience? Well, to these people, as he would write, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 12 and 13. Because if you hearken uh, to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall give thee the covenant and the mercy which he swear unto our fathers, and he will love thee, bless thee, and he will multiply thee over and over again. In the book, you can read such language as that. You do what I say. Continue in my covenant. Keep yourself separate from, from, from these other nations. Be a, a snare to you. He says, I will, in, in every way possible, I will reward you for that. He will, the church today. If we will obey and honor his word on fellowship, then the church will be a glorious church, as God intended it to be. Because there's a very ugly word to describe those who will cross the line of fellowship and those bound, and that word is harlotry. It's either purity of the church or harlotry. <clears throat> and we do not have the right to take something so precious that costs so much, it took the blood of the Son of God to purchase and relinquish that to prostitution. Now, all of you here, many of you, well, I say many of you, some of you are older and you've You've been aware with battles uh, that have taken place, and there's been a lot of these at the churches. Uh, Tieism, liberalism, and on and on the list could go. But it seems, and this would be a judgment, I don't know of anything any more subtle or anything that has divided good brethren like this matter of fellowship. Anything, what has, has blurred the lines of distinction in the Lord's church any more than this. And uh, just say one other thing in closing. If you have someone that is going to stand for the truth and you may be accused of being on someone's side, you're just doing this because uh, you're a line follower of someone else, well, that's going to come. But a lot worse things than that will come. But if someone is going to really uphold the truth, uh, don't be ashamed to stand with them and speak on their defense, not because of who it is, but because it is right. And if fellowship is the process, if it comes for the members of the church, and this happens, and this futile thing by experience, when you do this, you do it with the right attitude, and you do it in love, when you, we, I went back and read the letters that we have written in disfellowshipping individuals. And you know, if we want to disfellowship someone, don't write a letter and tell them what kind of scoundrel, how sorry they are, and just several pages of this is nothing but just old, old trash and we're going to withdraw from it. No, you write the letter and you do that in kindness to pray for this individual and uh, in hopes it will return and just a personal note, I have received mail. Uh, I've been called. And it's all right. I said last night this is going to happen. should expect this. They've been called liars. 
uh, ingenuous, you name it, we've been called that, and uh, I have, as everyone will, and then at the bottom, signed in Christian love. <laughs> so, be, be consistent in your practice on things. If you're going to write that someone's in a scoundrel, don't sign the letter that way. Well, I'll, I'll stop the poem. You know, Terry uh, described himself to me as a just a good old boy from north of Georgia, but I kind of like to think him, of him as a good old boy in the kingdom of heaven. It, uh, it may not be the case in these times we uh, fall down before graven images and idols and what have you, but nevertheless there there are those brotherhood who have their idols, maybe their organizations and their uh, particular efforts or even their relationships that they feel will give them some sort of advantage, make them be a uh, slot. And uh, by doing that, that becomes their idol. And they will sacrifice a sweet fellowship that is uh, set forth on the pages of the New Testament in order to advance those particular uh, agendas or hardships. Uh, uh, it's all to their detriment, and it's a thing, but nevertheless, uh, the reality is what it is, and we must stand for truth regardless of how it may impact uh, dear French that we uh, have had for so long. And I, th I think it is the case that when it comes to matters of friendship, that may be the defining issue of our time as to who is actually in the faith. Uh, who will they fellowship and who will they not fellowship? What project will they sacrifice in order to maintain a, a God-ordained fellowship? Or will they uh, sacrifice uh, God-ordained fellowship in, in order to maintain their organizations or endeavors or what have you? So we must all be uh, uh, cognizant of that fact and, uh, and uh, wary of that and, and uh, avoid that ourselves, and I think if we do that, we'll remain faithful and pleasing to God, and that's really all that we want to do. We'll uh, uh, be dismissed for about 10 minutes and reconvene at the top of the hour. Uh, the, the books are on sale in the back if you'd like to uh, look at those. Uh, there are refreshments in the back by the spring congregation. You're, you're welcome to that also. So we'll, we'll reconvene at the uh, top of the hour. Thank you.